welcome to episode seven of Killer Stories. I'm your host, Bobby Holmes. I upgraded my microphone equipment, so hopefully moving forward, I'll have better audio quality. I almost didn't upload last week because I had this annoying lip smacking sound that was happening during every pause and it was driving me nuts. Um, But making a podcast takes a lot of time and I was just way too lazy to re-record. You guys, who else was excited to see Netflix bring back Unsolved Mysteries? The original series ran from 1987 to 2010. I must have been a true crime addict from the get-go because I loved watching that show. Well, it's back. Netflix released the first six episodes. There was even one about UFO and alien abductions, which I know doesn't really fall into the true crime category, but that stuff is right up my alley too, so at some point I'll have to cover unexplained stories. Today I'm talking about Unsolved Mysteries Episode 6, Missing Witness. Sandy Chapman was a single mom with six children, all girls. Brandy, Lena, Robin, Jeannie, Rachel, and Rosie. We interrupt this podcast to inform you that I'm an idiot. (laughs) I really struggle with unique names. If there's more than one way to say it, I'm like literally always wrong. Apparently, listening back, the first half of this podcast, I say Lena, and the second half, I say Lena. I'm pretty sure it's Lena, so I apologize. (laughs) Let's get back to the story. Sandy worked multiple jobs and long hours to provide for her family. The girls all said growing up, she was a loving mother. She never drank or did drugs. She was straight edge, religious even. Every night, she tucked them in and told the girls, God bless and love you. But she did have one vice, men. But she didn't just find one she liked and stayed faithful. She had a pattern. If she was with someone, within about two years, she would start sneaking around on them with another man. She starts new relationships without ending the first one. Each time, she would move in with these men, dragging her entire family with her. In November 1999, Sandy married a man named Albert McCullough. They moved from the Ozark Mountains in Missouri to Fayetteville, Arkansas to live with him. The girls adored Albert. They said he was a great stepdad to them. Sandy was going to school to be a nurse and was hardly ever home. Albert was the one who took the girls to all of their gymnastics and sports practices. With six kids, I'm sure that's a lot of running around. Albert was a good dude. He treated both Sandy and the girls well, but soon Sandy grew tired of that relationship. That two-year mark came, and she was ready for something new. I'm sorry, but if you know this is what you're like, be honest with yourself and just don't get married. Marriage is meant to be a life commitment. This is already Sandy's second marriage. Anyways, behind Albert's back, Sandy starts a new relationship. The worst part is that this new man is Albert's brother, Gary. When Albert finds out about his wife's affair, he gets into a full-on brawl with Gary. They were out in a field, rolling around on the ground and throwing punches. Albert had Gary pinned to the ground, pulling back his fist ready to land the next punch when Sandy comes up behind him and hits him with a stick. But I finally talked to Gary and I told him, I said, man, I'm I'm done. I said, that girl ain't nothing but trouble. You better leave it alone. May of 1996, Sandy packs up and moves the whole family back to Missouri to live with Gary. He had a large farm with lots of animals to care for, so the kids were put to work. They all had chores to do. They had to cut wood and help feed all the animals. But after a long day of chores, Gary would take the girls into town and treat them with ice cream. In December of 1996, Sandy and Gary were married. That makes this Sandy's third marriage. The girls knew it was messed up that their mom left Albert for his brother. They loved Albert, but Gary was actually a pretty decent guy, too. 
We lived with him for three years. And he taught us things that I will never forget it. I'm disciplined. I don't depend on any man to do anything for me. And um, I value that. Gary's a good guy. He's a good guy. Just got mixed up with the wrong person. And that's it. In March of 1999, Sandy was like, whoa, what am I doing? It's three months past my typical two-year marital relationship mark. Since Gary is now old news, Sandy starts dating a younger man named Chris Klemp. She even introduced her new boyfriend to her girls. That is so weird to me. You're married and you bring home another man and introduce him to your children? What an awesome role model for your girls, Sandy. Gary isn't stupid. He figures out pretty quick that Sandy is cheating on him. He was once the other man. I'm sure it's not hard to figure out the signs. In early 1999, Gary was arrested for writing bad checks. But Gary didn't write those checks. Sandy had access to his checkbook, and she was the one responsible. Enough was enough. Gary called Richard Anderson, who was a friend but also an attorney. He told him about Sandy's infidelity and writing the bad checks in his name. He said he was going to file for divorce. They must have had some blowout fights. One day Gary took an old shotgun over to a friend's house and asked him to hold on to it for him. He said, take his gun, put it somewhere. He said, she let on like she was going to kill me with that, you know, he told me, he said, she's actually stuck that in my belly and pulled the trigger. But I broke it open. And it had a shell in it. I said, you said this thing wasn't loaded. And I said, it's got a shell in it. He said, I always unload my gun after I shoot it. And I said, well, you didn't this time. I said, because it's still in there. So I took my pliers out of my pocket. And I went to pulling it out. The powder started spilling out of it. And I said, Gary, I said, this, this is a live round. When I showed it to him, the look on his face, I ain't never forgot it. It dawned on him that she stuck that in his belly and pulled the trigger. He said, if that had been a good shell, he said, I wouldn't be standing here right now. One day after school, the girls got off the bus and ran up to the house. Sandy was blocking the doorway and told them a cat had kittens up in the field and they should go look for them. Everyone took off running to find the kittens. But Brandy stayed behind. She had chores to do. It was her job to milk the cows after school. After a few moments, she walked into the house to get some supplies. She found Sandy on her hands and knees, scrubbing the floor with what seemed to be bleach water. Brandy said she had on shorts and her hair was pulled back in a ponytail, both of which are unusual for Sandy. The whole situation just seemed weird to her. That night, Sandy sat the girls down for dinner and told them if anyone asked them about Gary, he went to Diamond to buy roosters and never came back. They had spaghetti for dinner and they don't know anything else. Brandy and Robin both remember this conversation. Why would Sandy need to say that if she didn't know something happened to Gary? Or more likely, the one responsible. That night, Sandy instructed Lena her second oldest daughter, to make sure everyone stayed in the bedroom. Robin said she was really young but still remembered something wasn't right. Lena fell asleep on the floor guarding the girls' bedroom doors. In our room, there was a window. And I see Mom and Chris struggling, trying to carry, trying to pull something big. I mean, it was Gary, no doubt, but... You know, he was wrapped up in something. You could see the boots that he had had on, but it scared me bad. I didn't even talk about it until I got much older and I was able to talk to Detective uh, Everly and Martin about it. May 11th, 1999, Gary doesn't show up for work, which is highly unusual. He was always on time, never missed a day of work. He was a hard worker. He really was. And Gary never missed work because he couldn't afford to miss work. So when he didn't show up to work, you know, there a couple days, we knew something was bad. 
bad wrong. Immediately to, to everybody that knew him, we, we wasn't looking for Gary being gone somewhere. We were looking for, for Gary's body. After two days, Gary's cousin Robert McCullough called the local sheriff to say he's been missing. The two of them drove over to Gary's farm to try and figure out what was going on. As they pull up to the farm, they see one of Gary's cows was out. They were walking the cow back to the pasture when Sandy comes up the driveway with Lena in the front seat. She gets out and asks them what they think they're doing. The sheriff explains that they came to ask some questions and noticed the cow was loose. He follows with, do you have something you'd like to tell me? To which Sandy says, yes, I've been meaning to call you. Oh, my husband's been missing for two days. I've been meaning to call you. Whoopsie. People are so freaking stupid. Sandy's story is exactly what she instructed the girls to say. Gary drove to Diamond to buy roosters and never came back. When the sheriff asks if she wanted to file a missing person report, she says, yeah, I probably should. The local police department launched an investigation and within a week had a search warrant for Gary's property. They were not able to find anything of Gary's. No clothes, no belongings. It didn't even look like Gary lived there. They did find a checkbook, but it had the name Christopher Klemp on it. Two days after the investigation started, Sandy's boyfriend Chris moved in with her into Gary's house. I mean, I guess if she only has two years with Chris, Sandy doesn't want to waste any time. Everyone found this very suspicious. Immediately after this thing started, I asked Sandy to take a polygraph. She looks me straight in the eye and says, you find a body and I'll take a polygraph. The sheriff interviewed all the girls about Gary's disappearance. Lena, who was 13, reacted very differently than the other girls. She was defensive and protective of Sandy. You could tell she knew a little more than she was letting on. Before the interviews, Lena coached her sisters and told them they don't know anything, so just mind their own business and don't say anything about Gary. Sandy was the boss, but if she wasn't there, Lena was second in command. Even though Brandy was the oldest, Lena's personality was better fitting for a person in charge. Lena told her sisters that the reason they couldn't talk to the police was because if Sandy got in trouble, they would go into foster care and be separated. Although Lena was bossy and seemed to enjoy being in charge of her sisters, she was a mother figure to them. She loved her sisters and did not want to jeopardize their family. Chris Klemp, Sandy, and her girls all moved to Sligo, Missouri in August of 2000. They only lived there for a year, but during that time, Chris and Sandy got married. This is number four for Sandy. Poor kids once again have a new stepdad. As she got older, Lena became more distant. When I met her, we go to parties. She wasn't into the drugs and stuff. She wouldn't even drink. But later on, she got into that stuff. You could tell there was something that pulled her that way. You know what I mean? But back then, I didn't really realize what it was. She just lost herself for a while. You'd catch her staring off to space, and you'd ask her what's wrong. And then, you know, you could tell she was really thinking about something because, you know, she'd be teary and she'd dry her eyes and brush it off like nothing had happened. Something was building up inside Lena. She couldn't take it anymore. She confessed to her boyfriend that she knew what happened to Gary. He told Lena if she knew something, then she needed to speak up. It was not fair to Gary's family to be left in the dark wondering what happened. She decided to talk to Albert, Gary's brother, and her former stepdad. At this time, Lena was 17 years old and pregnant. She met with Albert, and he secretly recorded their conversation. Who killed Gary? Paul. Well, okay. He was still at the house for some sex. He walked out and shot him three times in the head. Two, maybe three times. And they were on the couch. I, and she couldn't have it when we got home. And she wrapped him up. 
It's a little hard to hear exactly what is being said in that audio, but Lena says that Gary was sitting down eating scrambled eggs and Sandy just came up and shot him two, maybe three times. She wrapped him in plastic and tied it with hay strings, then drug him into her bedroom, which I know she couldn't have done that alone. Carrying a dead body of an adult male upstairs by yourself seems impossible. Albert believed that Lena was telling the truth about Sandy killing Gary. Lena helped her clean up. She said Sandy burned his body and then scattered his ashes all over. In this episode, they show a clip of a truck driving down the road with someone repeatedly throwing ashes out of the passenger window as it drove. It looked like a small arm, and Lena was only 13 at the time this would have happened. Albert gave the recording of Lena's confession to the police, but Sandy must have found out that Lena talked. The very next day, she got a lawyer who convinced Lena to recant her confession. Lena was supposed to come back in a day or two and come find out her mom had found out to come down and talk to him. And they both lawyered up. I wonder what, 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 what the hell you need a lawyer for. Guilty, guilty, guilty. The taped confession now means nothing. When someone starts flip-flopping their story like that, nothing can be taken as truth. Lena must have felt trapped. She talked to her sister Brandy about what was going on. So now Lena and Brandy know what really happened to Gary. The next day, Brandy got into a huge fight with her mom. Brandy said she knew everything and threatened to call the police. Sandy stares her down and says, get in the truck. Chris was driving, Sandy in the front seat, and Brandy was riding in the bed of the truck. They drove for a while and came to a stop. Brandy jumped out of the truck bed and walked around to the front. Chris came from his side and pointed a gun at her head. Terrified, Brandy starts screaming and trying to get her mom's attention, who is right in front of her, but she's staring right past her, avoiding eye contact with Brandy. What a cold-hearted bitch. Brandy didn't know where they were. She was scared that if she tried to run, they would kill her. She didn't know what to do. Instincts set in. She needed her mom. She needed to be loved by her mom. She opened the passenger door and squeezed her mom tight. She cried and said, please don't let him hurt me. A long silence passed. Finally, Sandy said, please don't hurt my baby. Chris lowered the gun, jumped back in the truck, and drove them home. After that night, Brandy was afraid to say anything about Gary's disappearance or what happened to her. She feared for her life. This rocked her world. She didn't picture her mother as a person who could hurt anyone, and Sandy just sat there, emotionless, while Chris held a gun to her head. Lena also changed her tune. She never spoke another word about Gary after Sandy lawyered up. November 3rd, 2003, Lena gave birth to a baby boy. She named him Coulter. Lena was forced to grow up fast. She was just 17 years old, but now she was in charge of another little human. She calmed down from the party scene and focused on her family. She was living with her boyfriend, Jason. They had plans to get married. Lena worked multiple jobs to help provide for her son. While she was at work, Sandy looked after Coulter. Gary's family filed a civil suit against Sandy and Chris for his wrongful death. We were alleging wrongful death and that Sandy and Chris Clemp killed Gary McCullough and that Lena was, in effect, an accessory. She conspired and helped get rid of the body uh, and... 
by reason of that, I thought uh, there was a good chance Lena would get immunity for her own actions in exchange for providing testimony against the people who were truly responsible. And that was the hope. As it turns out, it didn't work out that way. Apparently, this stuff takes years to actually happen. November 17, 2008, a deputy went to serve Sandy, Chris, and Lena with papers regarding the civil suit. He served Sandy and Chris, but Lena was nowhere to be found. Sandy told the deputy that two years ago, Lena ran off to Florida with another guy. Backtrack. February 14, 2006. Robin shows up to Lena's apartment. Jason answers the door and says that Lena is gone. According to Sandy, Lena left. She left Jason, her three-year-old son, and just took off with some guy to Florida. Brandy was regularly hanging out with Lena. She said she didn't know anything about a side piece or Florida. Anyone who truly knows Lena says she would never, ever leave Coulter. He was everything to her. Not only did she supposedly leave Coulter, but she had tons of photo albums full of pictures of him and her sisters. She didn't take any of them or any of her clothes. She didn't even say goodbye. Sandy told the girls that Lena was saying really bad things about them and didn't want anything to do with them anymore. Just seems very out of character for Lena, who seemed to finally have her life together. Plus, she was regularly seeing her sisters, Brandy and Robin. They had a good relationship. When Albert found out Lena was missing, he immediately knew Sandy was responsible. Robin spoke with police and shared her suspicions of her mother's involvement. She made missing person posters with Lena's picture on it and put them up all over town. Sandy paid her younger sister $5 each to take the posters down. Why would you do that unless you had something to hide? And so later on, I called her. I called her on the phone and I told her, I said, you know, I know, I know you're the reason Lena's not here. You know, you messed up this time. Now, you, now it's one of my sisters, you know, um, I'm going to be the one that finds out. One way or another, whether it's Gary or Lena, I'm going to be the one that finds out and make sure you rot. And she would put her little fake voice on like she always did. And she's like, you know, how could you say that? You know, I'm your mother. You don't talk to me that way. And I told her she wasn't nothing. And, and I hung up. Brandy believes Sandy killed Lena because of her confession. Even though she recanted, It could still be bad news for Sandy in the upcoming trial. But there seemed to be a second motive. Sandy had six girls. She always wanted a boy. When she found out Lena was having a boy, she became overly obsessed. Once Lena and Brandy were driving to Arkansas so Coulter could visit with his father, Sandy called flipping out. She was screaming and crying, saying, You turn around. Turn around right now or I'm going to kill myself dramatic. Sandy cared for Coulter daily while Lena worked. She taught him to call her mom. He was three years old when his real mother went missing. Brandy told the Salem News that right before Lena disappeared, her and Sandy were fighting over legal guardianship of Coulter. But if Lena is working and is physically able to care for Coulter, then why on earth would Sandy need legal guardianship? Sandy filed abandonment charges knowing that Lena wouldn't, more like couldn't, show up for court to defend herself. Sandy was granted custody of Coulter. I don't understand how. She is a person of interest in cases of two missing people. Remember the Bonnie Haim case from episode 4? Michael lost custody of Aaron because he was the main suspect in his wife's disappearance. Yet in this case, there are two missing people and Sandy is the common denominator. The court just hands over Coulter. How the hell did this happen? The woman is currently in the middle of a civil suit for wrongful death. Brandy came forward to police about the night that Chris held a gun to her head while Sandy sat back and watched. She testified in court. 
The result of the civil suit was Sandy and Chris were responsible for the wrongful death of Gary McCullough. They were to pay $7 million to Gary's daughters. I guess I need to learn a little more about the judicial system. There isn't enough evidence for a murder trial, but it's good enough for a conviction in a civil suit. But paying a hefty fine isn't enough. These people should be serving time. Sandy and Chris divorced in 2014. Shocker. But holy crap, Sandy, that was 14 years. How'd you do it? I'm pretty sure they only lasted that long because they killed two people together and had to work through all the lies and the bullshit to stay out of prison. Sandy, of course, remarried, husband number five, and she still has custody of Coulter. Brandy hasn't seen him since he started kindergarten. Sandy has been homeschooling Coulter. She doesn't want him finding out the truth about who his real mother is and what happened to her. But Brandy and her sisters plan on telling him when he's old enough to handle that information. He deserves to know who his real mother is and know that she loved him and didn't abandon him. Both Brandy and Robin, who were the only two siblings to be interviewed for Unsolved Mysteries, say they will never stop searching for Lena. If she was buried, there are two places they suspect. When the family lived in Sligo, Missouri... There was a well in the backyard that's no longer there. The thought is that the well was filled in before they moved. If Lena was inside that well, it would be near impossible to find her now. In 2006, the family had moved to a new property. There were four trees by the front of the house that Sandy told Robin she buried their dog Toby there. But Sandy had already told her that they buried Toby at the Sligo property at the top of the hill under a tree. Why would she change her story? Maybe to hide the fact that it was actually Lena buried by those trees and didn't want anyone questioning why the ground was freshly dug up. With permission from the current residents, Brandy and Robin brought investigators to the old properties to examine the areas in question. They used a ground scanning tool to see if they could find any previous disturbances which would show them where to dig. They spent all day searching, but didn't find Lena. I miss her so much. If my sister could hear me right now and tell her I'd love her, I just know I will always try to find you, you know? I will never let anybody just forget you. And that's what I'm trying to do with Lena. Sandy and Chris declined interviews for this episode. If they were innocent, that would have been a great opportunity to prove it. Armchair detectives everywhere went nuts over this episode. Netflix released a Google Doc of unseen footage, some of which could change how you look at this case. Apparently, police had questioned Lena's statement from the beginning. She told them the day that Gary went missing, she went for a ride in his truck with him. She supposedly didn't want to be seen, so she ducked down on the floor of the passenger side. Pause for a second. I'm not sure what to do with this information. Where did they go? Why didn't she want to be seen? Did she know something was going to go down, or was it simply that she wasn't allowed to be out for a ride and didn't want her mom to find out? Regardless, Gary's truck was taken into evidence after the investigation started, and the front passenger floor was littered with garbage. The police stated that no one has sat on that floor in a long time. But why lie? Also, what does this have to do with anything? I guess just that it discredits Lena as a witness? Outside of Sandy and Chris killing Gary, the only other explanation I could think of was that maybe Lena killed Gary and they helped her cover it up. But why would she do that? What would be her motive? Plus, she was only 13 years old. But, as we learned in episode 1, young teens are definitely capable of murder. I just don't see that happening here. Another tidbit of information from the Netflix Google Doc, Chris Klemp's ex-wife Jennifer spoke to police. 
She told them that one day her and Chris were having a heated argument and he said, I can't worry about this stuff right now. I've got to worry about killing a man. And this was right before Gary went missing. One Reddit user claims to be related to Lena. On the day she disappeared, he claims Chris randomly showed up to Lena's apartment. He told the landlord that she ran off to Florida and wouldn't be back. The Reddit user said the landlord decided to do some renovations before renting out the apartment again because there were stains on the carpet. He tore up the carpet and there was a giant blood stain on the wood beneath it. But no report was made of this when the landlord spoke to authorities. So this Reddit user could be blowing smoke or maybe the landlord was paid off to keep quiet. Another piece that was left out of the episode Lena was not formally reported as missing to police until two years later. Her father, Robert Chapin, made the report. So many questions. Where the hell has Robert Chapin been this whole time? (laughs) I didn't even know the girl's father was around. Why didn't Lena's sisters report her missing? Police didn't even know until they were trying to serve her with the court subpoena. But the great thing about Unsolved Mysteries is, well, one... It gives you a true crime fix, but it also is an opportunity to obtain new information about the case. If you know anything about Gary McCullough or Lena Chapin, visit unsolved.com or contact the Dent County Sheriff's Office at 573-729-3241. You can find my source information for today's episode in the show notes. Please rate, like, and subscribe to Killer Stories wherever you listen so you never miss a new episode. Follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Killer Stories Podcast. Email me any story suggestions or just to say hi, Killer Stories Podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, this has been a killer story. (laughs) 